Seahawks fans, wherever you may be, welcome back for another edition of the Seahawks Playbook Podcast. Join your host, Phil Alpstead, and co-host, sports writer and football analyst, Keith Myers, as we talk Seahawks football. Hey, Seahawks fans, welcome back to another edition of the Seahawks Playbook Podcast. I'm your host, Bill Alpstead, sitting down with Keith Myers. Hey, Keith. How's it going, Bill? It's going, it's going, it's going. Yeah, we're up to uh, preseason game two, uh, offering a little bit of a preview here in this show. Um, last week, we lost a close game, not that it matters, uh, to the Pittsburgh Steelers. We had some good showings, you know, I think on the on the whole... Uh, more positives and negatives out of that game. I really liked the positives, especially as it related to our two offensive tackles and, and boy, mm-hmm. Mafe and a couple other things were really good. Now we get a chance to solidify some things uh, with those same players. Also add in a few other uh, showings. Um, and it should be a, a, an interesting outing. Um, right off the bat, though, Keith, we need to talk about the impact that both injuries and a COVID diagnosis is going to have on this game and possibly the season when you really think about it with, with Drew Locke, Keith. Yeah. So Drew Locke was set. Apparently he was um, being given the snaps with the ones this week and was going to start in this game, but he was diagnosed with COVID. And so he is now out um, for a week or until he gets through the protocol and can come back. So that's a week's worth of reps that he's not getting. A week's and worth a, of reps. And a game. Yeah, a week's worth of reps with the ones that he's not getting. And um and, start, and he likely and he likely won't get those back because Pete was always going to have him take the ones this week. Uh the plan was to have him start game two. Um, and now that's gone. And mm-hmm. and we're far along in the process of evaluating these quarterbacks where after this game you were likely going to have your starter kind of set so that the team could move forward, give the starter reps in practice yep. for the next three weeks, um, not including the, you know, the last game, uh, but three weeks until kickoff on September 13th, you kind of want to have that decision made so you can give those reps in, in practice. Now that's out of the window. Gino mm-hmm. Smith's going to start this game. I'm not sure exactly how many snaps he's going to get. I would assume at least a full half, if not three quarters. And that opportunity could be gone for for Drew Locke. Now, there's an outside chance that he could still reclaim the number one spot overall um, just because of the time. But that game was essential to, to, the, to the decision-making process that the team had to go through. And it's such an unfortunate situation for Drew Locke uh, as a player. It couldn't have come at a worse moment. Yeah. So the other, the one thing though, is this is only the second year with um, there being three preseason games and then two weeks of practice afterward. <clears throat> so we don't, we don't have a full read on how Pete Carroll is going to play this. He may be, okay, well, Gino's going to get the start and we'll see some Jacob Eason and all of that. And then once Locke comes back, he'll get the third um, preseason game to start and then they'll make a decision. We don't know. Um, yeah. And so it's just a matter of, um, yeah, I mean, we'll see how, I I agree with you. I think that it means that Gino's going to have the, um, the job just because he's been there and practiced and Locke hasn't, but I still have a little bit of hope that, um, we're going to be able to see, um, Locke get a chance to claim it. Yeah, just because I I think that he's he's the younger player. He's got the most upside. He's I'd like to see him start the season as the ones we've seen. Um, Gino and we know he's not good. So all of that know. makes complete sense, Keith. It mm-hmm. just does. It makes complete sense. But if you really listen to what Pete Carroll said this week, Gino's still in the lead. Drew Locke's doing everything really well, but, you know, blah, 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 blah. Um, 
when you take a look at the Ross, I'm, I'm trying to get the holistic idea of what's going on here with Pete. And here's what I'm thinking. He looks at this roster and he's going, this roster's kind of more evolved than I, than I even thought. And I thought it was going to be okay. If you take a look at the roster minus Russell Wilson, this roster is actually better composed with more talent and deeper than when Russell was here last year. And if Russell was on this roster, this possibly could be an 11 win team, maybe even 12, you know, but without Wilson, it's now a seven win team. And so in his mind, I think Pete's going, what's going to give us the best chance to win? Where's, where are my players? Who's, uh, where are my quarterbacks in relationship to those players? Uh, who has standing? Uh, who's got command of the offense, et cetera, who gives us the best chance to win. And it's really close. And I think he edges with Gino because he's the known quantity. He respects him. He's been in the system for three or four years. He, he, he has the, the highest floor of the two quarterbacks and the lowest ceiling. And so therefore it's the safest pick for, for Pete Carroll to make for this roster by a nose. And so I think this decision may have been made in Pete's mind even before this COVID thing happened. I don't agree necessarily with it. I'm just thinking I don't. That could I, I, be the thinking, I, Keith. Again, you're gonna who's the best who gives us the best chance to win six or seven games. It's not an optimal situation, but this decision was made in March. I don't they, think they that's had that true. trade, Keith. They had the trade. Drew Lock came. They said all the right things, but Gino was always the guy there. Get, uh, unless something earth shattering happened with Drew Lock, it didn't. And so, what I'm saying is, they made the decision to go into the season with these two quarterbacks, knowing that it was going to be subpar with either choice. And now that they've got a roster that looks like it might be better ready made to, to win, if we had a quarterback, it's it's kind of an unfortunate situation that we've put ourselves in this in this deal. The only saving grace, I think for me, that's kind of saves this season possibly is some sort of Jimmy Garoppolo acquisition after he's released by the 49ers. I don't they're not gonna trade for him and they're not, they mm -hmm. San Francisco wouldn't trade to Seattle, but if he's released. They're, they're going to probably be in on that deal because I think he would be a, a step above Gino or Drew at this point and give the team immediate opportunity to win nine, 10 games. Yeah. I mean, he would, he would, um, he also, if there, if that, tr if that move happens, it's probably going to happen right before week one, like during that cut down, which means, okay, they would, he would get cut. CX would swoop in, grab him, sign him. Um, he's going to take more than two weeks to learn all the protection calls and, and, you know, even though he's in the same similar, very similar offense, it's a similar offense, but the, um, the terminology, the verbiage, the cues, these things, they are different. They're similar in grand scheme. When we start looking at, um, blocking assignments for in the running game and, and, uh, route concepts and that kind right. of stuff, but all of the, the, the more wonkish details of you know getting the line calls right and what the coaches want you to um see and communicate and and that kind of stuff like those are things that take more time they just take time and you're not they're going to be different no matter in shane waldron's offerings than in sean mcveigh's and sean mcveigh's is different than um you know schottenheimer's down in um san francisco where garoppolo's at so it's going to be a it's going to be an adjustment. <coughs> that what said, is your I was what is your evaluation of the of where the uh, where the team is roster wise over the entire spectrum? Given the state of the quarterback situation, what is the best move forward for the franchise? I mean, you've talked about you know. Let's be honest with it. The quarterbacks are what they are. Mm -hmm. uh, the roster aside, or or regardless of where the roster's at, we're going to lose a lot of games this year. Maybe one score games, but nonetheless, we're going to lose those games because we don't have the quarterback that's uniquely positioned to go win games. Mm -hmm. And so, um, 
what is your position now that we're in week three of training camp and we are where we are? How do you view the rest of the roster? I view the rest of the roster are pretty good. Like the, um, there's, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, there's a lot to like about this roster and, um, but yeah, the quarterbacks are going to lose us a bunch of games. And that's why I would play Drew Locke over Gino. Because if the quarterbacks are going to lose us a bunch of games, Drew Locke at least has the talent to go win us a game or two with the um, in a one score game where Gino doesn't. How does this Im- this diagnosis impact your? It doesn't where you're at with that right now. It depends on, it doesn't, it doesn't change that as long well, as, you know, as you long know, as COVID. This is a, well, yeah. So my thing is, as long as it's a typical COVID and you're back in a week feeling better and able to get out and practice and that kind of stuff, um, we're far enough away from the season that it's not going to affect him. <clears throat> I would still roll with, with Drew Locke. Um, he's got more talent. He's got a bigger arm. He's, he's got more, more mobility. Um, the, the offense is just more release. dynamic with him. Let's be honest. Drew, you it know, is. Geno Smith is Mr. Checkdown, and yeah. you're gonna be. It's gonna be safe. Maybe the tuner. You, you have slightly less turnovers. Maybe not because when you play conservative like that as a quarterback, you tend to make more mistakes because you're trying so hard to just be vanilla. To, yeah, to, to and, not and actually. Whereas play quarterback. I think Drew has that mentality where he's wants to elevate and he wants to go for it he wants to get he wants to make those special plays he wants to give our players an opportunity to be special in space and so forth and Gino it's just wired a little differently he's just more conservative that way and that's why I think Pete Carroll likes him but for the same reason I think Pete ultimately wants to give his his players the chance to be special as well and so I I agree with you Keith I think Drew Locke is the better quarterback 2012 go back to 2012 and I get that that Russell Wilson was special, but he wasn't truly special in 2012. Um, there were flashes of brilliance and a lot of struggle um, during the first half of that season. But Pete Carroll went with Russell Wilson because he was the only quarterback in that competition who gave the di- offense a chance to be dynamic at times. Um, I really think that this is it's kind of a similar situation. You've got Geno Smith, which is Matt Flynn, you know, 2.0. He's going to check down everything. He's not going to throw the ball more than 10 yards if he doesn't have to. Um, And while, yes, you're going to string together some drives and be okay with that, you're also going to struggle because it's going to take one sack or one penalty to end a drive because you can't do anything. And Um, and you lack explosive plays, Yeah, which is a Pete Carroll pillar on offense. Yeah, and we're with, with Locke, you're going to have more mistakes. You're going to have more drives end because of mistakes, but you're also going to have the opportunities to extend drives when you couldn't before. You're going to have op- opportunities to go for big plays and stretch a defense um, that you wouldn't with Gino. And I and what Pete Carroll has said recently about Gino and wanting a quarterback or a, a point guard and and not that does not match what he's done historically which is, you know, both with Russell Wilson as a rookie and in his time in college, where he goes with the more dynamic player. It'll be interesting to see what, what, how Shane Waldron impacts that conversation, you know, inside the VMAC. Um, now, who does Shane Waldron want? Yeah. That's, that's what I want to know. We could talk about who Pete Carroll wants, but who does Shane Waldron want? That's, that's actually probably a, a much larger impact than, um, than is being talked about, really. I would imagine the the autonomy there that Pete Carroll has given Shane gives him a real opportunity to to make his voice heard in this conversation, and he doesn't have an allegiance necessarily to Geno mm-hmm. Smith. He wants his offense to be successful in in the in the best sense possible, and that might mean Drew Locke. I mean, these guys are seeing what we see. There's no question about it. These are these are professional. Football evaluators, talent evaluators, game, in-game situations, they see these players day in, day out in the practice facility, how they work, how they communicate with other players, uh, the respect level, the leadership qualities, et cetera. There are so many intangibles that we can't have access to. And so it'd be very interesting. I just think true, uh, 
you know, when it really comes down to it, this COVID thing is huge. I mean, the timing is just awful. And so it does have an impact. We can say it doesn't, and there's extra time and so forth, but man, you can't take, you 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 can't can't get these snaps back. You can't take a week's worth of snaps, especially the week where Locke was supposed to get them all with the starters. This late, of the, this late the in the evaluation process, too. And he was supposed to start this game. And even if, okay, they move, they push it back and he starts a third game. If he was to, supposed to start this game and then use this game to win the starting job, he was going to start the next game anyway. Yeah. So it, it, of course, yeah. it matters. Okay. I just don't, I just think in the end, it's not going to change the result. Okay. So let's move on. Um, so the Seahawks made a big trade. Yeah, let's talk um, about that. And uh, by a big trade, I mean, did anyone notice? Small trades. Um, yeah. <clears throat> they, they traded um, cornerback safety Ugo Amadi, uh, who's in the final year of his rookie deal, um, to the Eagles for a wide receiver slash tight end. Um, JJ Ar- Arcega Whiteside. Arcega. That's, that's the part I was going to miss. Um, Whiteside. So... Who comes in at 230 pounds as a he's converted from wide receiver to tight end, which he's only up five pounds from when he was a wide receiver. So in my head, I go, I don't care. Two, 237. Yeah. Well, the key thing about this, Keith, well, well, two things. This is a big trade in what it says about the state of the, the roster, that particular position group on defense, more than what it says about this thing impacting the offense and it's it's more about the subtraction i think than than actually this this um addition now our sega white side if you guys remember was the wide receiver we've talked about him we talked about him during the draft run-up uh in 2019 as being a player that might fit that physical uh wide receiver profile that siak at that time didn't have uh they passed on white side he went to the eagles seven picks before uh dk medcalf so this is this is that player he's got that yeah uh, you know four four nine speed with the 34 inch vertical and the six two six three two you know at the time 225 so he was that red zone target guy that we thought maybe would be a target for the seahawks they passed on yeah. him they did like him in the draft turns out but they, they went they with Med- the medcalf draft. and the rest is history yeah. yeah, and Whiteside completely washed out in Philadelphia. Yeah. I think in in um, in two seasons there, full two seasons, he has 290 yards, 16 catches, and, and a score over 40 games and seven starts. So mm-hmm. complete washout for for his draft uh, status. Um, now gets traded with Amadi. And so so now we'll talk about the substitution wise on defense. Amadi goes out as that Nichols. Uh, corner guy in in the Seahawks defense. I think they were ready to move on from him. He didn't have a great year last year. Uh, Justin Coleman was brought in to probably start in that spot. They've uh, transitioned uh, Kobe Bryant to play some of that so that they've got some scheme diversity as well as Marquise Blair uh, competing in that spot. So it was it was looking awfully. Um, apparent that Armadi wasn't going to make this roster. So this trade really helped both teams uh, evaluate players that they were likely to get rid of. Yeah. I mean, what you have with uh, Amadi is, is he was, um, I mean, he started at free safety the last two games of the season. So let's not say that he wasn't, um, you know, a, a player who made an impact and, and that kind of it's, stuff. So it's true. Yeah. Um, he started at free safety. He was the backup free safety and he was also um you know, for most of the season, the starting nickel corner. And you're right, he didn't have a great year in that role, but he didn't have a terrible year in that role. Um, But what it says is that the Seahawks are comfortable with out him. They like um, uh, Josh Jones as the catch-all safety in the back. Mm -hmm. So they don't need um, Ugo Amadi They've got a guy that they like in the back. Um, yes, as as a backup free safety. Yes, um, between him and and Blair, they like um, what they're seeing out of Colby Bryant and want to get him on the field more. Which yes, which means even if he doesn't win the starting job on the outside, he's going to be the nickel corner um, and come in and and be that slot guy. They um, they didn't they felt like they didn't need Amadi. They had yes. 
it, it, what it really spoke, it really speaks to the development of Colby Bryant and Tariq Quillen. That the, those two guys have made a guy like they're Amani ready. They're ready expendable. To go. They've made him expendable by being that good that quickly. Now, we know that Tariq Woolen struggled some in the first preseason game, but he's not going to be expected to play week one. So, yeah. Um, and he responded well in practice this week, too, after coming off that he did. game. Yep, he had a had a really good week of practice. So, um, I think that it, it what it shows is that the uh, the cornerback room is much better and much more developed than what we had thought coming in. Well, it, when we looked at the roster, we've we've done some roster evaluations and player uh, profiles in in the last few shows, and it the safety and cornerback room combined defensive backs as a whole there were going to be some players left off of this roster. And we were kind of counting on Trey Brown to start the year on the unable to perform list. Which I still uh, think he will. And just so that we had enough room for Marquise Blair to make the roster. You know, we were talking about uh, making the roster just by default, in in essence, uh, in, in the old way of looking at it. Now that he's off the roster, Marquise Blair all of a sudden is now solidified on the roster. I think that was the largest impact. That still gives mm -hmm. Justin Coleman being on the roster too, and 10 defensive backs overall. I've got Jamal Adams, Diggs, Jones, Ryan Neal, and Marquise Blair uh, from the safety spots, and then Artie Burns, Jones, Bryant, Woolen, and Justin Coleman at the corners making this roster with John Reed and Mike Jackson just off, and that's with Trey Brown not starting on the on the, the active roster to begin the year. Uh, when he comes back, they'll have to make a decision. But now Speaking of Trey Brown, I mean, he's a guy that – once he's back, once he, you know, six weeks in when, you know, if, if that's when his knee is ready for him to come out and play, he's a guy who also will push for playing time and will push for playing time in the nickel spot. It's a good problem. Um, and so if something happens along the way, we have some injuries and that kind of stuff, you're getting this nice bit of reinforcements, you know, mid season um, with the starting caliber corner um, coming. Yeah. You know, off and he doesn't have zone. to come back at six. That's the earliest. They can keep him there for a while. Uh, as, as a kind of a shadow player if they need to. Um, and yeah. if, if no injuries spread. happen, you know, mm -hmm. it, it's just a nice thing to have in, in the back pocket. Um, not for him necessarily, but for the team, it's a, it's a good situation. And that it, it points to the idea that uh, Amadi was expendable. All I think right. It also, the other half of this though, is what it says about the, the, the wide receiver slash tight end positions. Okay. Because so let's talk <laughs> about that. Because, um, you know, Metcalf, Lockett, Swain, and Eskridge were all out in the last game. And it was awful. Um, because, I mean, those are your top four wide receivers. And Cody Thompson is done for the year now. Yep, Cody Thompson um, lands on, on injured reserve. And he was the only guy over 6'1 on the roster other than DK Metcalf. Yeah. Well, um, what is it, Derek Young? Derek Young, yeah, right. Yeah, from Lenore, right. But you so, know what I mean, like an experienced guy. <laughs> yeah, experienced so you've got guy. you've got Lockett, Metcalf, I think Goodwin. The, the way the coaches are talking about Goodwin, it seems like he's on the roster. So you've got Goodwin, Swain, Eskridge, and then Penny Hart, Derek Young, Bo Melton are all there. And now you've got Whiteside in here. Depending on how the team views him, I mean, he's up to 237. He was uh, in the, the Eagles training camp as a tight end this year. He kind of made that pivot and that switch for them understand the Seahawks want to view him as more of a wide receiver however I look at this a little differently maybe you can help me with this I look at Kobe Parkinson as being part of this equation as well because Kobe Parkinson's been practicing really well he's popping in practice but when the game time came he had he was the lowest graded player on the entire team in this last game dropped the pass um, in the end zone that would have been Drew Locke's third touchdown pass um, and Whiteside kind of comps to Kobe Parkinson as far as being that player in the red zone uh, that can help you out in, in that respect. Kobe Parkinson is probably not going to come in line and block for you, so they view him more of as a receiving tight end slash wide receiver, big wide receiver. Mm -hmm. Whiteside isn't going to make the roster as a wide receiver with those guys in front of him, I don't think. It's just too crowded, but he could push for the Seahawks to keep "Quote unquote, two tight ends on the roster, Noah Fant, Will Disley, while adding a sixth or seventh wide receiver in in JJ Whiteside if it works out. Now this is just a tryout for him. He was going to get cut from the Eagles. There's no guarantees here at all, but it does give the opportunity for the Seahawks to look at him as 
you know, as kind of that red zone guy. Yeah, it definitely gives him a chance to push um, Colby Parkinson because, I mean, Parkinson's in his third year. He is like this great promising thing. It's six, seven tight end with, um, you know, yeah. out there, but he played a lot more snaps last season than I think most people realize and did nothing with them. He's not a good blocker. Um, and, you know, Whiteside is going to be a terrible blocker. His is a true Jimmy Graham style tight end that can catch passes and do nothing else. Um, but, you know, he's, he's not a special player, but uh, he is a receiver. He is a guy that can do the wide receiver things and asking him to line up on the outside and be DK Metcalf um, was a mistake because that's not who he is either. Um, but giving him the opportunity to line up in the slot, be the big slot where he comes over the middle and gets, um, you know, those kind of receptions. Like he has a chance to be good in that role. And so where did, where did JJ, uh, okay. Or, or Kesh white side fall because, you know, in, in high school, he was a Gatorade player of the year nationally with 108 receptions for 1,824 yards and 20 touchdowns as a senior. Went to Stanford, uh, mm -hmm. ended up with, um, you know, 48 receptions as a, as a junior, 781 yards and nine touchdowns. And then as a senior, 63 passes, almost 1,100 yards, 16.8 average, 14 touchdowns, ranked top five nationally. Uh, and then he, you know, in two years, 40 games or three years, 40 games, seven starts, 16 catches for 290 yards. Like, where's what happened? Where's the disconnect there? Well, I think the disconnect is um, he's not fast. You know, he's four or five. Um, and that yeah. will yeah. that will get that. That's fine in college and in high school. Where and it's fine you, for a tight end. And it's yeah. Um, but as a wide receiver, like you've got you've got cornerbacks that are faster than you that make it hard to cover and when you're six two six three uh 225 you're not you're not changing direction on a dime either i just think he was easy to cover uh, he's not athletic i mean even even though he played basketball and all that kind of stuff and he high points great he's not super athletic he's not fast enough to break away he's not fast enough to get off the line i think he his his 10 yard split was one five eight i think mm -hmm. um in the, in the 40, which is really slow. Um, you want them to be 155 or, or, or faster if possible. At that size, I get it. But nonetheless, he's not special in, in any respect that way. But I understand he's tenacious. Like, he's a tenacious wide receiver. He's, he's very competitive. He likes to go out there and compete. He high points the ball really well, et cetera. I think the Seahawks would have to view him in that role. We'll see. It's very crowded there. I don't expect him to make the roster, but it is a nice basically free opportunity for the Seahawks to evaluate a player that they like coming out of the draft. So um, I think we may have lost Keith uh, a little bit, so I'll, I'll move on a little bit here. I just wanted to go over before we kind of talk about the game slightly, I want to go over a couple of injuries. Um, we talked about Ken Walker um, having the hernia situation, or maybe we didn't. Uh, Ken Walker has a little hernia thing going on and, uh, we don't know exactly what the hernia is. Um, there are two or three types of hernias. One's a belly, you know, uh, umbilical cord hernia, which is higher. I think maybe you could play uh, with that possibly. But a sports hernia is where your stomach muscles and your groin muscles come together. And if there's separation there, that hernia, type of hernia, can only be repaired uh, by surgery. And if you wait now because you're thinking, well, he's got an opportunity to heal, it's just not going to happen. Um, mm -hmm. it, it just doesn't work that way. And so that would impact him all year. He would be less explosive. He would be guarding that injury. It's better to have the surgery immediately and, um, and give him an opportunity to come back, uh, after six or, or eight weeks. Um, and if you start that clock now, uh, that would be, you know, three or four weeks in, into the season, you'd probably have him come off injured reserve after week six. It's not the optimal thing for, for Ken Walker. We all wanted him to come in and have an impact right away. But I think the idea that DJ Dallas had a great game on Sunday ran really hard and Penny's coming back is, is available this week gives the Seahawks a little bit of breathing room as far as how they treat Ken Walker. They don't want to rush him back. Well, yeah, they don't want to rush him back. And they also don't want um, they don't want this to linger all season. Because if you let this go and you're like, oh, well, you know, let 
let him, he'll feel better with some rest and the inflammation will go down. Yeah, but here, like you said, he won't be explosive. He won't be as fast. He won't be Ken Walker. Um, so they're better off letting him get the surgery now and have the last three weeks before the regular season be part of his recovery time. Because that means you go out to week six when he could come off injured reserve. That gives him nine weeks. It gives lets him fully recover, get up to speed, really where he's pu- really pushing hard up yes. to speed before and, you can and come you back get back into shape. Because the first two or three weeks after hernia surgery like this, you're doing nothing. I mean, you yeah. can't even cough yeah. or breathe like hard or anything like that. You're down. Mm-hmm. And so your atrophy is going to creep in on your legs, especially. He's going to have to work, you know, two or three weeks to get his legs back. And so I think that six to eight weeks is conservative. The nine weeks I think would be optimal. Get him back halfway through the season and and uh, recharge your running back room at that point. Um, it's unfortunate, but it is what it is. D. Eskridge. I wanted to ask you about D. Eskridge. He's yet to come on the field. He can't run full speed. At what point, Keith, do we start to be concerned? about the uh, Eskridge long-term health a year, not just a, this. A year ago um, when he couldn't get on the field and didn't all season. I think at this point um, he has yet to, to practice, so he's eligible for the the um, the pup list. He lands there. He is not someone that you depend on this season. If he comes off the pup list and manages to stay healthy for a couple of weeks, then great. Um, but you have to plan going forward that he isn't going to be a guy. Which – for better or for worse, you got to go with the guys that can be on the field. You know, the mm-hmm. best, we've talked about this, the best quality in the NFL is being able to be available on Sundays. Yep, the, um, best, and the best ability is availability. And you've got uh, Derek Young and Bo Melton waiting there. And um, and a guy like Marquise Goodwin as well that's, mm-hmm. that's basically filling that spot and also Freddie Swain. So you've got some young guys that, and, and a vet who've got the ability to kind of take over. And um, it's unfortunate for D. Eskridge. I think everyone wants to see what we've got there. He's explosive. We all know that. But if you can't stay on the field, you can't be available. You can't even evaluate him. Um, he's likely to not be on the active day roster. Right now, he looks like the um, wide receiver version of um, Penny. Yeah. Right? Just all the talent, but never on the field. And that's unfortunate. Because he does have a lot of talent, and he would be fun. He's a great little weapon player that you can line him up all over and do lots of fun things with him. But and this really goes back, and I hate to say this, but the evaluation leading up to the draft last year, when Creed Humphrey was sitting there, man, that would have solved that. That would have turned this offensive line that we currently have into the best offensive line in the NFL in 2023. I think. Yeah, because if you replace Austin Blythe, who's a journeyman veteran, with um, Creed Humphrey, who is, is all pro. Be a second year player and all pro <laughs> at center. Um, all of a sudden you've got, yeah, you've got the best offensive line in football and you and I were both pounding the table for that oh, both sure. before the draft Probably and, were. and during the draft, I couldn't um, believe he was there. I honestly, it was like a gift was handed to the Seahawks. And, and when they, they made that selection, it. I I liked D Eskridge as a prospect in the draft. But at that point, when you've got both those players sitting there, that there's no question of who you picked and that was a huge mistake Mm -hmm. okay um marquise goodwin is also out just wanted to make that uh, available they want him ready for the opener um in fact Pete carroll said again we're looking for the opener see if we can get him ready for it so in 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 those words it seems to me like he's counting on him to be on the active roster we'll see uh jake curran is also dealing with back spasms so he's probably likely out in this game as well yeah he's he's out in this game he's day to day um, <clears throat> as a, um, as, as far as like his availability, this isn't like a long-term thing. And then the positive news though, is, uh, the return of Rashad Penny and yep. Jordan Brooks for sure. Jordan Brooks is much needed in that middle linebacker spot. We've talked about the depth there. Um, and then cornerback Sidney Jones and Freddie Swain all return to the practice field. So those, that's great news. Yeah. Um, I wanted to talk about a few players. I'm just going to list them out. Maybe we can run through them really quick as we kind of preview this Chicago game and what we want to see. Um, Geno Smith. Like, what do you, what do you think? Geno Smith. Um, the reason I bring that up is now he seems to be the guy, at least the guy now. Yeah. Um, and so what do we want to see from him in this game? I want to see him 
not just be check down Charlie, um, you know, Charlie Whitehurst. Go and actually run the offense. Get the ball into the hands of your playmakers. Don't just yeah. check down, be safe, take three yards and get off the field. Get the ball to the better players that are 15 yards downfield. Um, and and we've seen the protection was there in the last game. Let's see if that. Can oh yeah, over. absolutely. I mean, um, going back and re-watching some of that game, um, Abe Lucas wasn't just good. Oh my gosh, dude. I've got him I, as, as a subject to talk about. So let's just talk. He wasn't just good. He was borderline dominant in that game. Like I yeah. knew he, he played all right, you know, having watched, you know, but I was trying to evaluate a lot of different things going back to specifically watch him. And you're like, okay, this kid can play. Did you happen like, to see the Doug Farrar article for USA today that came out no. this morning? Yeah. No. He, he wrote up this great article where he featured uh, Abe Lucas and then uh, also backed that up with some video of, of four or five key plays out of the game. And Abe Lucas was was dominant like nothing yeah. short of dominant uh, now you got to take it with a grain of salt preseason it's not, yeah it's preseason pittsburgh's throwing out whatever but um he took the opportunity that he had and he made the most of it when it mm -hmm. counted and that's what you have to look at in this particular situation so he pancaked guys he drove guys down the field he put them on their backs he protected uh, he recovered well when he when he did get beat initially off the snap. Um, all the things that you would want a seasoned vet to be able to do, he did as a rookie in his first game. His first preseason game. Yeah. And um, like, like I said, going back and re-watching just to watch him, I was like, okay, this is good. This is like um, kind of like watching Dwayne Brown play a few a couple years ago before his decline started like he looked like he could be in a normal seahawk year where their line's terrible he would have been the best offensive lineman on the roster and you add it to cross's play which was stellar as well yeah um yeah they really it really looks like they hit it out of the park with the two tackles which um, is which is so so nice mm-hmm I mean, think about the the downfall, the, the the drafts we've had, the players we've brought in. It's been hit and miss and so forth. But to knock it out uh, in one draft and you end up with two starting tackles out of out of the same draft, that doesn't happen. I mean, that just really doesn't happen. And we've talked about this. I think the last time this happened was, you know, you have to go back years. And so it's it's nice to see. It gives a really good upside for the future of the, of the franchise because um when you have a solid offensive line that you can carry forward year after year it's just so much easier to have the, that continuity and, and stellar consistent play um rashad penny being back and available that's good i don't know if he'll get a lot of snaps in this game i don't they expect to wanna, see him much i yep. want to meter him uh, especially now given ken walker's sta uh, status so that's mm -hmm. a great opportunity for dj dallas josh johnson travis homer to kind of step up in this game um for, i, I want to see dj dallas run more because he ran hard he ran was decisive he looked he looked really good in that first he game. did look really good and if he, he did looked, look really good like he we knew he had the athleticism because he showed up on kickoff returns we had the dynamic like explosiveness if he can continue to run like that between the tackles um and I really think this outside zone scheme fits better than the inside zone that they ran um, in previous years. Uh, it fits better for him. But if he continues to run like that, like, you know what? Go get Ken Walker that surgery because we're, we're good with Penny and, and Dallas. Now, if he comes out and struggles and goes back to, you know, looking more indecisive like he did in the past, okay, I'll feel a little less secure about the running back position. But um, I'm excited. Yeah, to and they may, does. and they in this last week, they if they did decide to do something with Ken, and they pretty much have to. Uh, it would be likely that the the Seahawks scour the uh, the remaining running backs on the market and or your roster cuts that are coming. So, mm -hmm. um, players I want to kind of watch in this game are the wide receivers, um, specifically Freddie Swain. Freddie Swain's back uh, now uh, for this game, so I kind of want to see. If he really goes out and competes, uh, knows that his job as the number three wide receiver in this offense is on the line, and he wants to go out and make a statement that he's still the guy, 
I'd like to see that. Mm-hmm. And then, and then rookies, uh, Derek Young and Bo Melton. I want them to build off that first game. I don't want any letdowns. I'd like to see them secure the ball. Uh, you know, when the when the ball is uh, catchable for them, um, and and see what they can do in open space too. Because I really think Derek Young has an opportunity here to be a special player, a number three or number four wide receiver in this offense, an um, impact player on special teams. And then Bo Melton showed what he could do uh, after he gets the ball in his hands too. So that's. That's kind of cool. And then, you know, with Cody Thompson going down, we talked about him being a fringe guy. Maybe if Drew Locke wins the job, he kind of makes the roster because he's he's kind of one of uh, Drew Locke's favorite targets. That's no longer an option. Mm-hmm. Uh, new acquisition, J.J. Arcasia, uh, Whiteside, I think um, if he has an opportunity in this game uh, to, to, to get some snaps, it'd be kind of nice to see him uh, out there just so I can see him move and f- kind of figure him out a little bit. Um, and then Kobe Parkinson. So if they kind of go back and forth and head to head, I want to see Kobe Parkinson step out and make some plays. Mm-hmm. He's apparently does this all the time in practice. And uh, but if he if he's not a gamer, he's not going to make the roster. You know. Yep. He's got to come out. He's got to show it on game day. Um, and the Seahawks put him on notice. They just they traded for a guy who could take his job. There's no hiding. Now there's no I'm going to make the roster because I'm I'm clearly the third best tight end right. um, with no competition behind me. Now you've got someone fighting for your job, so don't get comfortable. Go go play. Um, I talked about we talked about the offensive line, but I would just like to see the continuity continue in mm-hmm. in this game. We know Curran's not going to be in there. Let's find out if Phil Haynes is the guy at right, right tack or right guard. Uh, that can be next to Abe Lucas uh, without Gabe Jackson in there. Well, let's let's see what's going on there. Um, a couple of other things. So Sidney Jones is back. I want to see uh, him. I want to see the continuity and continuation of Kobe uh, Bryant and Tariq Woolen in this game. Let's see if they can be better, uh, learn from their mistakes, and, and kind of come together. Yep. Uh, and and Marquis Blair now is is kind of has a new opportunity there um, as being a slot cover corner guy. Um, let's see if he comes in and, and has a ton of minutes there and how he performs. And the last guy I want to talk about, Keith, and you can talk about this too, is the linebacker Vi Jones, undrafted rookie free agent, um, signed with the team, North Carolina State, six foot three, 227 pounds. He's kind of lighter for that position, but he's got an 80 inch wingspan and a four, five, two, 40 time, super athletic, long. The team likes him and and they didn't like him because of the, his scheme diversity didn't he lead the team in tackles in the first tackles preseason and camps? he had a sack with he had six overall tackles one tackle for loss with the with the sack um and they like him because he's he's got the scheme diversity so in the game he was playing middle linebacker um but they've lined him up this week's practice at the outside linebacker spot rushing the passer uh, from the strong side. Um, so they really want to find out what he's all about. And, uh, and he can also make an impact on special teams. He had three or four blocks in college at NC state playing special teams, just his senior year. Um, and then, um, he's, he's by competing at middle linebacker, he's got himself an opportunity to make this roster. Absolutely. Right. Because, yeah. The Seahawks have two middle linebackers and a big gaping hole behind them. Yeah. Um, and if Jones goes out and continues to show and continues to look good, um, he kind of yeah. wins that backup job by default because there's no one else. Well, there. let's talk about Nick Ballor, Keith, because I think that we need to talk about the elephant in the room here. Do Nick Ballor is to? getting to be like 33 or 34 years old. I don't have that in front of me, but I know that he's in his <laughs> mid thirties and he's a special teams guy, but he's not a linebacker. And this team is, void of depth at the linebacker position if you're going to use a roster spot for nick Ballour, just because he's kind of your special teams cap i get it i get it but at some point you need to think about the future and you need to think about moving on and you got this by jones kid coming along and he's a special teams guy now he can block kicks for you and he can play all three spots at the at, at the linebacker spot or four spots now um you've got to go with a guy like vi jones i would think I don't think that that is the competition. I don't think it's the competition between the two of those because if you want Nick Ballor on your team, 
because of he's a special teams captain and does all this great special yeah. teams things, you list him as fullback because he's the only fullback on the roster. Um, and so I think they can they can move Nick Blow around. They know he can play middle linebacker in an absolute pinch if if the worst case scenario happens. Right. And so having him um, on the roster, like he has that versatility and experience and all of that. I don't think that you're keeping Vi Jones off the roster to, to keep Nick Ballore. I think you're keeping Penny Hart off the roster or um, Joel Ibu away, or even Tariq Smith starts on the, on the, the, the unable to perform list or the injury reserve. And they kind of keep him off the roster now. And, you know, for next year, mm-hmm. a guy like Vi Jones has an opportunity then for sure. Yeah. I, I don't, I think Vi Jones um, has a path to a roster spot that doesn't include Nick Ballore. Okay, I get it. I mean, there are a number, of, like you said, there's a number of different ways you can tweak stuff in order for him to have a spot. And there's, there's no doubt. And I think the easiest one is probably Tariq Smith starts the year somewhere else, um, or or Leia Boomwe is off the roster somehow or another. But they, they, um, and and there's not many veteran presence uh, opportunities that the team has at the linebacker spot, except for maybe. Nuasu and now Jordan Brooks. So, mm-hmm. um, anything else, Keith? No, let's let's wrap this up. Yeah, we didn't talk about Chicago at all, but I don't think we need to. I mean, uh, Justin Fields is there. Um, I understand they have a really poor offensive line, so in this game, I want to see our uh, rush uh, linebackers and, and edge players, as well as our our defensive tackles, have have a game um, and see what we can do against their offensive line. I know they played Kansas City last week. And um, and it didn't go well for their offensive line. So I'd like to see them have that opportunity. Other than that, you know, Chicago is about where the Seahawks are roster-wise, at least the way that the league evaluates um, their roster. They're, you know, bottom five in the league. Um, and so it'd be kind of nice to see the Seahawks perform that way, where they go out and just kind of dominate this game. It's preseason, I know, but I'd like to see that anyway. And, and rebound from a loss. I'd like to see how they rebound as a team. Uh, and I'm sure Pete Carroll will have them ready for that. So, anywho, let's uh, let's get out of here, Keith. Find Keith on Twitter, at MyersNFL. You can find me at NWSeahawk. The show is at Hawks Playbook on Twitter. SeahawksPlaybook.com is the website. You can find us on your favorite podcast platforms and YouTube. Hit that subscribe button and share. Until the next time, go Hawks. Go Hawks. Seahawks Playbook Podcast listeners, thanks for joining us for another edition of the show. You can find us on Twitter. Bill is at NW Seahawk. Keith is at Myers NFL. And the show is at Hawks Playbook. You can listen and subscribe to the show at SeahawksPlaybook.com.